From the Land Grant University in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, this is a Farm Doc webinar, the fall series of six. Today, we'll talk about the farmland price and how it's been a very, very interesting time. We'll have two presenters, and Gary Schnicki will be in the background to answer some questions if and when needed. Bruce Sherrick is here. He's a PhD, the director of the TIA Center for Farmland Research, and uh, the Pruin Professor of Farmland Economics. And Luke Worrell joins us from ALC, uh, from Worrell Land Services. I believe, Luke, that is in Jacksonville, Illinois, or at least in the western part of Illinois. Where are you and what exactly is Worrell Land Services? Yeah, Todd, you uh great memory. My home office uh, is here in Jacksonville, Illinois, west central part of the state. Um, company, uh, specializes in farm management, real estate, and appraisals, and thankful to be a part of, uh, of the crew here today. Well, you get to kick us off. Uh, why don't you begin with your first slide, please? Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. And I'll brag a little bit more on Luke. Luke has been an absolute uh, stellar leader in the Illinois Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers as well, and has done an awful lot to advance the a state of our understanding about farmland markets in this in the state of Illinois. So thanks, Luke. Appreciate your time. Um, again, a, a, just an absolute great contributor uh, through the Illinois Society and otherwise. Um, <clears throat> today we have a, a you know what has probably piqued a lot of people's interest in the last couple of years. Talk about farmland markets still again. I've done this for about thirty years now, and would have to admit I've never had as much interest as we have right now. Partly because we've just come through a two-year bull market in farmland values, where in the Midwest there are parts of Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa that are up well over 30% in absolutely true, well over 30% in value in just a 24-month period. We want to talk about what has led to that. It's it's partly the usual suspects and it's partly new things. It's not quite um, it's not as I think there was an old Buick commercial. It's not your dad's Buick or something like that, but it's not quite the same farmland market we used to have. And on top of that, we have, of course, a set of macro conditions that we've never experienced before and frankly hope we never do again. But we want to try to put that in context and say, what is the impact of going from three to six percent interest rates? And what is the impact of having a war in Ukraine? And what is the impact of having a Fed balance sheet that's now more than half the GDP? And what happens when uh, you, you print money at a pace that we have? And what happens when you add climate smart ag into the mix of support payments for agriculture? So we're going to put a lot on the table very quickly. Try to do it from a uh, if you're used to using Google Earth, there's sort of wide view and there's close view. We're going to start, you know, at 100,000 feet and talk about a lot of things from a distance and then start zooming in on regions and then start zooming in even further on types of commodity and then zoom all the way into what's a remarkable set of on the ground results from the survey of actual farmland man managers in Illinois. Again, um, Luke has been uh, thrust into a leadership role there, uh, kind of rotates through the society, but they do an incredible job. Only a couple other states in the country do even things remarkably similar, and I, I think ours is the best. I'm allowed to be a little parochial there. But we're gonna kind of zoom in on that. <clears throat> to start, I wanna talk about at a high level first, before we treat each of these elements in a bit more detail, what usually gets pointed at. So commodity prices, of course we've come through, as everyone knows, a period of time where you know 2019 kind of eliminated part of the surplus in the soybean side. And we've had world uh, demand issues and world supply issues that have kind of um, gotten together. They kind of conspired to create a perfect storm and increase commodity prices, not just for this year, but in the out year forward markets as well. And crop insurance prices higher than they had been for quite a long time. So the a level of guaranteeable or available revenue much higher. At the same time, we have interest rates and spreads over the cost of funds, those are separate items, but important, that have absolutely skyrocketed. I have a fun slide, tongue in cheek, I'll talk about how smooth the Fed's performance has been on moving through this crisis. Again, tongue up maybe all the way through my cheek on this one, but we'll look at that and think about why that does or doesn't register differently in farmland markets versus say housing or something else. Um, <clears throat> anyone hear about these inflation reports? I think it's pretty hard to look at any piece of news without being 
completely swamped with what's going on. How are we going to get through it? Is there soft landing possible? Not how do we coordinate with other parts of the world and so on? And that's that's has some historic precedent. So we have good content on that. What do we do with Ukraine? What would happen if that went away tomorrow? What do we do with demand from China? What do we do with the exploding ability to buy food around the world? Not just now, but into 10, 20, 50 years from now. The um, quality of diet is sometimes overlooked on a world basis in terms of its impact on demand. We'll try to put that into a simple context. Policy and farm bill and this new pivot toward things on the right, climate, carbon, and conservation. I, I joke somewhere that that's our new CCC instead of the Commodity Credit Corp. We have institutionalized part of that, and we've done part of it as kind of a, acute interventions in the market. But this is new. Also, consumers' preference for food attributes. Um, we now have you know, label competition for sustainable, uh, salmon safe, frac free, non-GMO, um, you know, name the other 500 things you might see on a label for food. I think it is at least clear though that during the pandemic when we stopped eating as much in restaurants and went to grocery stores, the appearance of um, uh, preferences in what we're willing to spend at food has changed. Those may be structural, they may be short-lived, I'm not quite sure. Another item that's a bit new, crop insurance, for better or for worse, for good or for bad, whether you like it or not, has become part of what I think of as the most permanent response to risk at the farm sector. And there are now recognitions of the connections to conservation activities that didn't exist five years ago. Some new uh, insurance programs, including the ability to ensure split nitrogen application, a rather novel and very, very positive option for many people. Uh, other conservation activities that may show up in crop insurance related programs. There used to be a pretty good firewall between the various titles and the farm bill. And just to point out that when those barriers are broken down, things change. Uh, finally, um, anybody check their 401k this week? Um, looking at what happens relative to other places where money could be stored has always been a consideration. The farmland markets traded in the large were not quite big enough where that really mattered. And again, the rest of the world demand, we'll talk about that as well. So I want to go through these kind of in a slightly different, you know, quick intro way to say what we're going to talk about. Uh, kind of the brief history of time. We've gone through a period of, you know, from the early 2000s with the ethanol boom, high corn prices, then kind of caught up and went through a long period of time with lower prices. And now we're back to higher prices. And one of the new things is their ex-US drivers for the commodities. Does that drive US asset values or not? It's a really hard question. How does that register long-term? That's a hard question. We've also had massive increases in input prices, both literal inflation and supply uh, chain interruption uh, to that uh, okay. side of inputs. So that's, that's a new thing, I think. And if you want just this graph on the bottom, just borrowed it from somebody. We have this new um, untethered federal spending in the last few years, justified or not, it's, it's true that we have just, um, uh, ramped up to a pace that we have never seen before. Um, and so this little chart on the bottom right, don't need to explain much about it. I just want to point out that the blue bars are just the additions from just the Inflation Reduction Act to just one of the titles. Now, of course, these aren't expenditures. These are authorizations, and I don't want to make too much of it. But I think we have become numb to things like the difference between a million, a billion, and a trillion and just expect programs to continue to be able to um, you know, come and go based on economics. And in this case, we're talking about a scale where long-term interventions might, might not go away so quickly. Um, this, this next one uh, has to do about inflation. Historically, agricultural assets have had a very positive inflation response. This happened though, when the money supply was not done in the same way that has been managed this time around. I'll talk more about it later, but uh, Gary's sitting uh, directly to my left. If I gave Gary $100 out of my pocket and said, you had to pay this back, we now have a $100 loan registered in our you know, micro economy system of accounts, but we didn't change the amount of money. 
if instead I, I, you know, and we lend money to banks when we deposit money in banks. And so that's fine. And we don't change it by how we create borrowing and lending uh, relationships. And that's what the Federal Reserve, in a sense, does with the uh, participation of the Treasury. But if I'm a bank and I have that $100 that I lent to somebody via the bank, and I said, you know what, my own CD rates are so high, I think I'm going to make up money. I'm going to pretend I have money on demand, on deposit, and lend it out. In a sense, we've, we've put so much of the balance of the printed money on the Fed's balance sheet that it does change the system and the quantity of money available to buy things. And we have to work our way through that quantity theory of inflation at minimum. And then as wages got stuck at higher levels, we'll have to work through that as well. Um, so I'm going to kind of jump forward a little bit here um, and say interest rates and cap rates and income multiples. This is a complicated thing, but historically we can think of farmland as the income it produces through time. That income is both in the form of current cash income. If you bought a farm and rented it, you'd get the cash income, but it's also the appreciation. The expectation that its value is going to go up at four or five percent a year or six or seven or three or two. And we want to think about how we're buying appreciation because and a couple of the questions submitted in advance were great. What do we do with an asset that only generates a three percent rate of cash return, but interest rates are now six? That's a great question. We'll talk a little bit more about that, too. But think about it this way. If I borrowed a million dollars at three percent on 30 year fixed rate money, my annual payments would be around 51,000. If interest rates go to 6%, that same payment will only uh, support a $702,000 loan now. So, or the payments would have to go up by 40% to, to support that same degree of financing. Now, debt is not the only uh, source of capital under farmland. So we have to think about when interest rates go up and cap rates go up and income multiples go up that we can't use the same old model of taking cash rent and dividing it by the 10% or 10 year treasury rate. So real quick, some level setting. This is the uh, USDA mid-year estimate of price change around the country. And I'll have a little bit more regional stuff in just a second, but the two year numbers, um, again, this is just USDA and this is all farms. So to be blunt, these are a little bit muted. We have numbers on this chart that don't represent just commercial investment grade farmland but represent all farmland. So we get parcels that aren't really, you know, representative to some degree. And we also get the results of neighbors fighting for that one parcel that'll never sell again. So relative to what's happened over that whole period against a uh, survey of um, auctions at the same uh, PI or CSR, CSR two point, things we can do in the Midwest pretty well. Th these numbers are actually a little bit light in my opinion, in terms of the total change, but they're remarkable. USDA has a lot of other sources we can look at. A great resource, uh, Dave Opendahl at Chicago Fed publishes the Ag Letter. It's become an absolute um, uh, baseline thing that we have to look at to understand, and it's a great survey. Uh, corroborating information, very, very similar. Um, again, this if you don't subscribe to that, I encourage you to. And then uh, probably the most um, well-informed institution, Farm Credit, has a survey and a set of things they do to benchmark against a standard set of farms through time. Again, highly corroborating information. Thanks to Kent and others in Farm Credit for also participating in the society information and, and trying to help keep the market fully informed. But again, this is just unprecedented. We have not had that happen before. These are Illinois and local region. If we put it on a chart, we could also say, hey, well, that bump up maybe was the aberration in 2012 through 2014, had a big drought in 2012, prices went up, 2013 prices still high. And maybe if we just kind of stretched a curve through that and said, what would be the long-term appreciation? We wouldn't think that today's prices are actually that remarkable. What we would think about is that we actually took too great of a pause during the period of time where we were artificially keeping interest rates pretty low. If we did this zooming out even further, relative to 1991. So you can just say, how did the regions perform on a relative basis? You know, land in the mountain states doesn't cost as much. Uh, land in the Pacific West doesn't cost as much. Um, but we kind of see that the areas, the Pac West Corn Belt, Lake States, Northern Plains, a um, little bit of a puzzle when we get out to the Pac West and the Pacific Northwest. 
but the same patterns to some extent, except the areas that have been brought more into intense production had a higher increase and in areas like the Northeast and Southeast that have more of the land uh, influenced by residential didn't have the same relative response to agricultural influences for change in value. Uh, NACREF puts out a great set of reports. I won't spend any time on this screen because we're about to go through them, but we can look around the region at identically accounted for rates of return with both appreciation and income, and we get the following story. If we look at all property that's in the index, one year rolling total return for, as of the middle of the year, 9.7%. Now, I'd, I'd personally be very happy with a 9.7% total return in my, um, you know, my IRA or my retirement hopes. Um, haven't had that this year for sure, had more than that a couple times in the pandemic, but the stability of this is really quite remarkable. And one thing that is different is if we look at permanent crops, this last year, they're actually below annual crops. Per permanent crops traditionally and in the long run would be expected to have a bit more positive return because of the depreciability of the above ground items but permanent cropland, 3.5, annual cropland, nationally, almost 14%. But here's what's remarkable. In the lake states, over 16%. In the Corn Belt, 26%. This is a one-year return for actual real farmland in a real funded position, identically accounted for, reported on an unlevered basis. It, these are real numbers and in the Delta states, 13 and a half. So down through the middle of the country where we grow a lot of corn, soybeans, uh, wheat, a little wheat, cotton, a little bit, rice, a little bit. So we have a good slice though of production agriculture represented in these numbers and they've just been remarkable. Now let's talk about why. Well, this inflation story we talked about has just, just go ahead and highlight the end here. If you look at the red line, which is the 10-year treasury rate, so think of it as like a reference interest rate around which almost all other interest rates are quoted. Uh, we think about the 10-year rate and adding to it for longer term, subtracting from it for shorter term, and adding to it for credit risk. Now, again, as you know, probably have heard the two-year rate and the uh, shape of the yield curve have been a little unruly later, uh, lately. So we can kind of look here at the end too. Thanks, Jim, for pointing out that the mouse is actually operational on the screen. Uh, the 10-year rate has um, generally been above the rate of inflation, the blue line, except during periods where we're going through massive economic realignment. So recession in the early 70s, uh, farm recession a little bit, um, the 2008 housing crisis where we saw a CPI um, somewhat reflexively also uh, shrink. But they've had that general pattern where the treasury rate is above the cost of inflation. So you would have a, um, a positive real rate in that case. And in the last uh, couple of years, we have had this, you know, it's not a very big mystery why we've had this big run up in inflation, frankly, but we've had this big run up in inflation. At the same time, we've artificially held rates fairly low for a long time. You know, only a year ago, you would hear the Fed say it's transitory, it's coming back. The last Jackson Hole meeting, I kind of heard a nice description of this on the financial news on the way in. Uh, the tone of the Fed has, has shifted from what do we think to what we're going to do. So the questions are, what happens when you get that kind of departure? Because we haven't actually seen it before. The early 70s weren't for the same reasons. And the 80s were basically a farm crisis, not an economy crisis, economy-wide crisis. And this time, it's a world event, not just a U.S. event. So can we make any sense out of what's going on there? Well, a couple of things on inflation to pull that apart into pieces. It's not all food. A lot of it has been energy. Energy is embedded into each of these pie slices and the way it's measured here. So agriculture, food and beverage includes the cost of inflation and packaging. And all the things that are summarized in this one particular version of the CPI. But housing also, when interest rates went down, the value of houses went way, way up. The expenditures on housing didn't go up by as much at first, but then kind of did, and now we've caught up. Again, the same features of a 30-year 30 30 interest rate would apply to residential in that it would cost roughly 40% as much for the, more for the same size 30-year loan when rates went from 3 to 6%. 
So again, this is a, it's a big deal, but it's not the only deal. And food and beverage though, have an element that goes back to the farm. This in my mind is the bigger deal. It takes just a second to explain this chart, but back in the housing crisis period, we had this low level of assets on the Fed's balance sheet, and that number went back through to roughly the 1930s. It was almost that same number forever. It's just a flat line. And we didn't know what to do when the housing crisis hit, so we created these things called liquidity facilities, this green line and this purple line here that look very small in retrospect. But at the time, we said, oh my gosh, what happened? The Fed doubled its balance sheet. But what the Fed did is they said, we will be the liquidity facility for people who run out, for banks that run out of money. And we had TARP and TALF and QE1 and QE2 and QE3. And remember, TARP and TALF were touted as unprecedented when they were $700 billion. $700 billion seemed like a lot. Again, in 2008, adding 700 billion, 780 billion, I think actually, was a great big increment on the Fed's balance sheet. And those kind of went away. The green line came back down. The purple line came back down. Blue line is the total. So what else happened though, is we started buying actual securities. We started buying the bonds the government was printing and putting them on, storing them in the, in the balance sheet of the Fed. And that's gone from you know, under 2 billion, uh, this is scale in millions. So 8 million means 8 trillion on the right because it's times a million. This is, this is the unprecedented thing. This, this is what really, really happened. And if you look at the bottom long-term scaled line, what we did during the pandemic was not just add to it, but we added to the rate at which we were adding to it. So we've gone to a point where unwinding that balance sheet, if we ever do, or financing that balance sheet, which we have to do, has a different impact on interest rates than even back in the housing crisis when we went from you know, under a trillion to over two trillion. And I wanna talk a little bit more specifically about that, use a couple of my common slides to do it. But first we're gonna ask you to tell us what the answer is. So just as a, as a way of getting a sense of the audience's belief, do you expect inflation for the next two years to be above six, average four to six, two to four, zero to two, or negative. Now, if we'd asked this question a year ago, which we did, and we've recorded it, we wouldn't have even included the top category of exceed six. But take a second, go ahead and click on your answer. Prove that you're still online and haven't bored you completely to uh, a stupor yet. Yeah, and Bruce, while, while they're answering that, I'll remind folks that we do have some sponsors that help out with our webinars, and we like to thank them on occasion. They include uh, your uh, group, the TIA Center for Farmland Research, Compere Financial, Corteva Agriculture, Farm Credit Illinois, FS Growmark, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, and the Illinois Soybean Association. I see that I only have 77% of the crew that has voted now, so that's a big number. What did they say? Well, 66% think it'll be in that category of four to 6%, 13% think two to four, 20% think over 6%. We have zero people who think that we could hit such a bad space of economic activity that we actually had deflation. Well, it's, a, it's still a distinct possibility that we hit a, a depression style recessionary event, but I'm glad to see that there aren't people who actually expected that. So here's the answer. So, so the, one of the great questions that was submitted in advance was, what do we do with the farmland market that we used to be comfortable getting a 3% return on because treasury yields were zero, or effectively zero. Now we get a 3% cash return and interest rates are three to six or even CD rates I've seen as high as 3.7. So the answer is, I don't know. But here's what I do know, that historically markets aren't, um, in, mar markets work pretty well, that we have a total return, including the appreciation. So if I'm going to get a 3% cash return, I might expect a higher rate of appreciation, part of which we've just gotten, right? We just got a 30% increase in two years or 15% a year, roughly. Maybe that was anticipating inflation. I think farmers are the smartest people in any economy absolutely turned out to be what we expect. And if we look all the way back to 1970s, so all those epics I showed in the previous slide, the thing that looks most remarkable to me is that the if we averaged across all 32 ag important states, the average return above 
um, the CPI has generally been positive. So the blue is CPI spread. So in the 80s, when it goes below the zero line, that is a negative. And the only other time is 2009 during the housing crisis. But again, that's a bit of a sympathetic response, not, not really a real response. And if you simply held from 2008 to 2010, that particular period went away. What's impressive to me is 2022. This is a forecast. We're not all the way through 2022 yet. But look at the very end of that chart, clear to the right. It appears to me that the difference that the ag community, owners of agricultural assets and people who are willing to buy or sell, expect that that relationship will continue and expect that inflation will continue to be fairly high. The, the rough math of taking the level of the orange line and adding back in the spread tells you what the expected inflation rate is, which again, in the ag economy says that over the last two years, the total return of 15% was to keep ahead by the average size of the spread. The average size of the spread by decade is given in the little inserted table uh, down below. Um, won't spend more time on that because we do have a lot to get through here, but I, I just find that to be a really remarkably consistent relationship. And again, we know there's a lot of detail here. If you'd like the slides, please download them. Jim's made them available in remarkably convenient form. Uh, made a lot of them look a whole lot better and they're available for you at the end of the webinar. And this webinar will be recorded and the slides are available. So again, something a lot of you've seen before, if you've heard me before, but updated through the end of 20 or through the middle of 2022. Can't do the financials till the end of 2022 because of the way we control for equal variation. But again, looking this slide I put up today primarily for the last two columns. In the um, and the S and P again um, minus fifty percent up thirty percent in one single year. Same with composite REITs from you know almost lose half the value to almost gain a third. Uh, these are slightly different. S and P you know is it comparable or not without dividends? I, I, I don't know. I'm not trying to make a specific point here. I'm trying to say that relative to financials, farmland returns also tend to be incredibly stable. Coefficient of variation much lower correlation with inflation much higher, and the stability relative to the maximum total decline or total increase is remarkable. So even when farmland goes down you know, 8% in value in a year, you still got your cash income. Farmland also tends to be held for a really, really, really long time. So it might be important to look at this by different holding periods. Institutional investors lots of times ask for a three-year rolling length of holding period return comparison. And so roll three, rolling three means if you held it every three years and um, looked at that, you would find out that the correlation for farmland with the CPI is still 70%. That's not what you get equities in the CPI. It's, it's not what you get with gold in the CPI. And so the, the correlation table here, again, I won't make too much of it. It's available if you want it as a reference. But the longer you hold, the better farmland is as an inflation hedge to a degree, and as an offset to equity exposure. So it's a great asset for institutional owners for exactly that reason. Against a mixed asset portfolio, it does exactly what you would hope it would do. Uh, this yield curve picture, again, I've used before. Hope it's not you know driving your eyes buggy on the screen, but it's important to interpret. The yield curve, each each line on this is, I'll go forward for a second, each day we could say, what is the yield for um, a treasury position with particular maturity? And we could say that line is, the dotted line is uh, last month, that's the closest to today I could get out of the Fed's data, it's verified. But a one year position, about two and a half percent, a two year position, you know, over four actually now, 10 year, just about three and a half as of the 17th and so on. If you plotted that through time, way back here in 2004, we had a yield curve that was bouncing along based on economic activity, had a lot of concern about uh, the run up in 06 and 07, Fed trying to manage it. We had some you know, responses and then the housing crisis hit and we just shut off the market, built this long period of trying to recover. Those little ripples at the front, by the way, correspond with TARP and TALF and all those elements on the Fed's balance sheet if you were to rescale these the same, they, they correspond very closely. And then we kind of say, okay, we're done. 
we're going to get back into the real world, let the markets take over. We got the here, and then we got to the pandemic and said, oh, hang on, we're going to, we're going to restart the economy again, stop. And the Fed had this new plateaued, held down low interest rates that, you know, one of my regrets is I borrowed a lot of money actually in this period of time, but I wish I borrowed a lot more. Um, didn't buy enough farmland. Wish I had a whole bunch of fixed rate debt right now that I don't have. That may sound like a funny thing to say that I wish I had more debt, but it would have been the cheapest debt that I'll experience probably in the rest of my life. And then we said, let's, let's restart. We have to get out of this inflationary period that we have built. So how are we going to do it? Well, let's look in context first. These, these, are lined up in a particular order. The red line that's solid is 2019, the green line is 2020, the orange line is 2021, and the blue line is 2022, January 1, or the closest date. And in a period of only nine months, we've taken it from that orange and blue line to the new red dotted line, and the short ended yield curve moved up much further than the long end. So it's not like the Fed can just take the whole yield curve and move it up or down. That's an important feature too, because farmland is like that blue line, a 10 year asset, whereas overnight borrowing is something different. And again, this is my tongue in cheek, intended to be a little cynical, apologize for those who don't like this characterization, but are very careful smooth, um, you know, completely transparent Fed, of course, manages these interest rates in such a smooth pattern, or maybe not. This is the history of the Fed discount rate through time. Uh, of course, you do have to respond, and there are like periods of time and moments of time where you do have to respond more quickly, but it, it does appear, frankly, to me to be almost entirely reactionary. If there were rules in place to just say, you know, had we had rules in place that were always the average of all the red dots you see, over a you know 10 preceding periods can't be more than you know quarter percent away from the others we would have had a much more tra smooth transition enforced and less of the responsiveness to the announcements on the wednesdays when the fed meets so again what's going on here is really dramatic and the 3.25 we're at now for discount rate relative to history even as recently as 06 and 07 is not really that high of a number but what is important is the place we came from. In 06 and 07, we came up through, you know, post.com, a fairly predictable increase through 05 and 06 as the economy was heating up, a period of time where things were going bad, housing crisis is that decline, and then a long, slow move up again. What's different this time is we ha didn't have a long, slow moving up. We just, we just did what we did. We're, and that shocks interest rates and it shocks the rates of return we can get to farmland. And most importantly, it shocks the cost of borrowed money. So real quickly, for a next poll, what interest rate on long-term 30-year 30 30 fixed rate farm mortgage loans do you expect to be in one year from now? Newly originated exactly one year from now. Go ahead and vote. This, this is partly to test that everybody is still actually online and that I haven't driven everybody into a you know, depression about the condition of the economy. Not, not me so far, Bruce, and I think it's pretty compelling. I will tell people that uh, you mentioned that they'll be able to get the slide deck. Uh, they can get that now. It's actually in the gray boxes, so they'll be able to download that. And Jim Boltz does that in a really, uh, really good way. They're uh, set there. Uh, in three different forms. There's a one-up, uh, two slides per page, and one that has six slides per page. So you really only need to download one of those PDFs, uh, one slide per page, two slides per page, and six uh, slides per page. It's really simple to understand what's there. So if you want the slides, you can get them right now. So I'll, I'll uh, get to the uh, last part of, of my presentation quickly here, but the audience believes about 30% believe over seven, about 40% believe between six and seven, uh, five and five to six, uh, the hopeful crowd that I'm in, four to five percent, eight percent of you, and under four percent, one percent. There's an interesting thing happening right now uh, where we are beginning to recognize the, re the relationship between debt and equity is not going to hold in the same way it had historically, where there are some sources of equity now that are competing with the cost of debt. Um, the one element on this one slide, again, can't update it fully to 2022 yet. We have good expectations, but wanted to show you these numbers that it's about 14% debt. 
So to talk about the interest expense at the farm level, one should still remember that on the long-term side, it's not a heavily levered um, portion of the balance sheet. Uh, so where do prices register? This is, this is where they register, commodity prices and forward commodity prices. This is a long period of projected prices and actual harvest prices from crop insurance. So think of these as the floor prices. The top, in each case, corn and soybeans is the projected or spring price. The bolded number is the actual price that um, was in place for paying most crop insurance policies. And what you see is we're at a high level of volatility and we're at a high level of prices relative to history. But what do we think will really happen in the fall? Well, here's as of yesterday, um, the two days ago, here's, here's what the commodity markets believed. So we have a really cool utility at our farm doc website in the tools section where you can just click on it and it goes out and grabs the market prices and said, the uh, option prices imply what people believe about future prices. And against the 590 projected price, there's only a 10% chance that prices will be below that at expiration. You can lock that in with options too, if you wish. So the actual, this is futures price, so local basis still has to be taken out for revenue. but. Pretty much a 50% chance around 686 as the tipping point of prices in the fall. So that's pretty good revenue if we happen to have a 250 bushel yield. That's, we, can, we can do something with that. So it means a little less above on the um, uh, insurance price, but still a fairly positive situation right now. A 50% likelihood of being above 1474 um, or a 30% likelihood of triggering harvest option on the payments from crop insurance. So I'll go to my last little set of items and I'll speed through these to give uh, Luke a little time to talk through the actual local results. But what about the strength of the dollar? We hear that too. And I wanna make a really important point about that. The strength of the dollar is not the dollar. There's not a singular article that you can apply ahead of that to make it into a single relationship. If I go back to the 2020, Right, it's the, the vertical line is saying at the moment we sort of shut down the economy for um, uh, the pandemic, 1 6 2020, and said everything was one. And then looked at the change in the number of external units of currency to a dollar through that time to now. What you find out is the Brazilian real takes way more real to buy a dollar. Uh, China went down for a while, has come way back up. So the strength of the dollar should be interpreted relative to who we trade with. And we trade a ton with Mexico and Canada and China. China trades a ton with Brazil. The, the math is a little complex, but you can also take the blue line relative to the Chinese line. And since they're both divided by dollars, that gives the uh, real to China exchange rate too. And you can think about how much more or less soybeans cost from Brazil now compared to the US. And what happens here is we have to think about this relative to the trading partner. We're, we don't when we talk about strength of the dollar for consumer goods because we mainly trade with China. So agricultural commodities are one of the few parts of our economy that we export more than we import. So we kind of want the opposite sign relative. I want to buy a 60-inch TV for $300, but I want to sell a bushel of corn for $9. Th those become incompatible if you're selling them both to selling one to China and buying one from China. So again, just as a, a cautionary tale, uh, good news in some sense, bad news for exporting um, to certain trading partners. So the summary of that, US productivity has not returned. I don't expect it to, but interest rates are really quite high. And the Fed is still stuck with this problem where the stock market still matters. And there's still at least some response to indicators that are not only employment and un and inflation. Um, ag policy, I don't expect the spending to be fully reined in. And I think the um, payments to things related to climate have to be added to everything we just talked about. But I think the biggest thing that we have to start adding into our thinking is not just how much can I rent my land for next year? Should I buy the parcel that's at auction that's you know a little bit of a long distance for me to take my equipment? As a lender, what is my lend-in rate? Can I go above 60%? We have to start thinking a little bit longer term in the way farmland is actually being held now. 
and the rest of the world really matters. So Jim's given me the, you know, the frantic speed up sign. I'll do it this way. If we were to look at the population in 2100, and we're pretty good at uh, um, forecasting population, some shocking things occur. Asia, the yellow line, uh, including especially China um, and India, grow and then decline because of the declining pattern of birth rates. But Africa gets healthier, and uh, longevity is compared to is a big driver of consumption because if you live for 70 years instead of 62, it changes your lifetime consumption by quite a lot, more than 10%. And then the amount of money that you can devote to food. But look where United States ranks. And I think it's really impressive to think about what a minor part of the world's population we are, and yet how much of the world's population we're going to be able to feed. The quickest version of this is, is incomes improve, life expectancy goes up as incomes improve, demand for calories goes up for two reasons. You, you have higher quality of calories and you are allowed to spend less of your income on food. So that curve in the bottom right explains the global demand for commodities expected through 2050. So this is why I'm very pro still agricultural assets. I don't, I don't know the pattern they'll take. I'm not going to say I'm smarter than any market and just have some long-term, the long-term thesis to me is really, really impressive. Now, again, I'll leave this to be, you know, thought about, debated, studied by the audience, or, you know, maybe disagree, but the demand for pork and poultry is not going to shrink. I'll, I'll go not out on a very um, tenuous limb to say that. Water is still a big deal. Water in Southern California, for example, is a massive deal, but we use such a small fraction of the you know, terrestrial cover to grow crops that moving crops from one place to another isn't the worst idea. And that could happen a bit. Ethanol demand, we have, you know, I'm not gonna get into it today. We have some great experts in farm doc around it, but the only demand for corn isn't ethanol. And the only demand for ethanol isn't um, to blend into fuel. And EV cars are not gonna come on so fast that, that the sky is falling. And we're also learning that other forms of renewable really favor agricultural production. I'm sort of famous for saying the only real solar collector we've ever invented is the plant. And the only chance you have to sequester carbon involves plants. But that's an important part as well. We're not there yet to know how the sequestering and storing of CO2 is going to change revenue to farmland. It might take 20 years, might take two years. I'm really not sure. I'm pretty confident in the crop insurance part. Um, again, speeding through here, um, the financialization, um, again, I've been doing this for about 30 years now, and I've been uh, saying we're two years away from having you know, agricultural financialization where we can buy and sell farmland really easily, but I've been saying that for 10 years now. So I've been wrong on the speed at which we'll get to that point. But we have never seen as much interest. We have a couple of great public vehicles, two publicly traded REITs, a few ETFs, a couple of adjacency ag tech funds, a few um, distributed finance uh, vehicles or crowdfunded. But what didn't happen is we didn't add debt while interest rates were low. And so it's still a hard asset to move from one category to another. Uh, the capital level in farm credit and community banks still exceptionally high. Um, community banks have worked through their excess cash, but the cap capital is really high. So kind of in my handoff, I'll ask next in my final slide, what do you think farmland values will be in five years? And then we'll turn to the answers from people who actually know. Yeah, so here's what uh, the question says. Do you expect farmland values in the next five years to be 25% higher, 10 to 25% higher? zero to 10% higher decline uh, by zero to 5% or decline by more than 5%. So go ahead and handle that. I asked, answered that question. Uh, we are about 40 minutes into this and we're moving actually at a pace that I think we can manage to get it all done nearly within an hour. That's uh, based on the number of slides that are left. And Luke Worrell is here. He again is with Worrell Land Services out of Jacksonville. Luke, there are the answers. Half of the folks thinking that uh, in the next five year, we'll have an increase of two to 5%, uh, 10 to 25% higher 
uh, for the price of land. This is something you and the uh, uh, folks that you uh, work with, along with the Illinois Society of Professional Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers, think about all the time. Uh, what was your assessment of that particular uh, poll? I, I wish I had more farmland. That's my my assessment yeah. of that particular poll. <laughs> That's my assessment of almost anything right now. So, but yeah, we're gonna yeah. move forward. And 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 Luke, I'm going to kind of provide a little introductory uh, comments here. But just as we go through, uh, one of the things we do is help uh, with a project where the Illinois Society uh, does collect and provide uh, curated data with people on the ground, boots on the ground, telling us what's really happened and figuring out how to, to process information around sales. And we put a book, little booklet together every year. You can find many of the professionals in the society there. And, and again, Luke's been in the leadership position for a while on this. Um, but if you want to find last year's book, you can go to the website. Um, we, we do it on 10 regions in the state. Um, I'm speeding you through to the launch point here, Luke. So uh, yep, you're you up bet. here, but um, we do this by categories of productivity and I'll let you go from there. Just tell us when to advance. Yeah, you bet. Well, go ahead and uh, I'll say a few things real quick is just to put it in context, you know, as Bruce said, we have a, a huge project that we do every spring that, you know, tries to encapsulate the full prior year. So um, we, we do always do a mid-year uh, update, kind of a mid-year survey. So I think it's important to note that you know, these numbers aren't uh, just grabbed out of thin air. We had over 80 professionals from across the state um, really answer a lot of detailed questions to try to get us uh, the best snapshot as possible for what we've seen here the first half of, of 2022. It should be noted that the, the questionnaire was completed after July 1st. Um, and we certainly are in, it continued to be in, in the middle of uh, a wild time. So, also important, everything we look here, let's remember what we just saw last year in some of those wild numbers. So as we get started here, you're looking right here, and again, nothing against regions 8 through 10, just different soil types. So if you see some blanks on these next few slides, it's just simply because those soils don't um, necessarily uh, exist in those regions or those classifications of land uh, aren't transacted enough to really give us a good sample size. But th the long story short, is that we have continued to see exceptional strength in the first half of 2022. You look at these number here, you know, on excellent quality farmland, and let's, again, let's remember that last year, over the course of 2021, we were looking at increases of, of 20 to, to 26 percent uh, in these regions. So you look, you look at that together, and, and quite honestly, we have seen around a 40 percent increase in the last 18 months or so. Um, in, in some of these regions, which is which is pretty pretty wild to to think about. You guys know which regions you're in, uh, so we'll we'll keep we'll keep moving. Uh, next slide, please. You know, one thing that was interested uh, or interesting to me is, is I was curious if you know lesser quality, lesser classifications of farmland were gonna were gonna kind of keep pace, or was the gap between Class A and you know B and C gonna gonna grow and and quite simply the answer is these guys are, are are running right beside Class A. I mean even the regions that I specifically work in, you look at regions three, six, and seven. I mean Class Class B or, or a good quality farmland has seen even higher increases in the first half of this year uh, than the high quality land did, which was which was incredibly interesting. Um, and even going further to the next slide. Um, you go down another classification and you're still seeing huge numbers. And here too, it's important to notice that y y now we're starting to incorporate more regions as well. So this is not, this is not a one-off. This is not a, a certain corner of Illinois. This is not a certain type of land. We are seeing continued strength, robust strength throughout the entire state and throughout all classifications. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, and again, so, you know, here we don't have as much data just solely based on, on soil types throughout the state. But again, broken record, uh, don't mean to repeat myself. Again, you're continuing to see anywhere from, you know, 15 to 17 percent, even on fair quality land. So everything, everything is, seems to be moving forward. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next one. I apologize if I'm speaking quickly. I'm trying to uh, get get through as much as I can and hopefully allow time for questions. 
Um, this was an interesting one to me, um, and I'll have a few extra caveats here. So when this was completed, this survey, you know, with, with 80 plus professionals, 56% feel that we likely had, you know, stay the same or let's say plateaued. Uh, the, the rest were, were kind of split. Some thought, hey, surely we're, we're going to start to see some softening, even if it is mild. And others thought we, we, had, we had room to run. You know, as we sit here now on September 22nd, we are kind of on the cusp of, of what we consider to be, you know, a uh, sales season. You know, typically we see transactional history pick up, you know, October through February. Now, now what I can say, and uh, with the caveat, is I can only speak for, for my neck of the woods here in West Central Illinois, but it's a small sample size, but the sales we have seen have certainly shown that we have at the very least stayed the same, if not continued to increase just a little. So I think the next four to six weeks when you, you know, you pick up any publication and you see a ton of auctions, farms for sale. I think the next, you know, six to eight weeks is really going to tell us a lot about where we're heading, not only through the end of this year, uh, but into to 2023 as well. Um, you know, granted, with the the ability of hindsight, um, I I would see us actually probably continuing to add some strength, um, and and certainly I don't foresee any decreases uh, in in the next couple of months. Um, let's go ahead and move forward. Luke, on on your own uh, business, yeah. are you seeing as many more or less about the same volume, not just price level, but what's your like auction and listing count? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. If anything, I think we're you know we're starting to see more volume earlier than usual. Um, you know, we even we even had some high quality farmland auctions in in, in August, which historically is mm -hmm. pretty quiet. You know, you don't you don't see, you don't see a lot pop off until uh, you know you get into harvest. But uh, you know, my neck of the woods, it's been incredibly active. I have colleagues across the state; they seem to to echo. Uh, my thoughts on that too. So I think I think we're getting a little bit of a head start uh, on transactions this fall. Yeah. So so this is always and, and the number. This is usually a, a big question we get is you know so so who's buying, who's selling, and and who's buying, and is that changing? You know. So obviously here, no surprise, estate or post estate settlements will always, in my opinion, vastly supply the farms that are, that are being sold. Um, what's interesting is, historically speaking, farmers or, or local growers are predominantly the, constitute the largest buyer pool. Um, certainly, we all hear about institution investors and uh, you know, the, the, the big names that, that get the headlines, but as you can see, I mean, local growers are still largely by quite a healthy margin, the number one buyer uh, of land that we see, we see sell. Um, you know, when I saw this this morning, I went back and, and, and looked at last year's slide that answered this very question. And there really is very little difference. And that almost surprised me to a certain extent, you know, because you seem to hear a little bit more about, you know, institutional investors or, or, or some of those big names. But this trend actually was very consistent to last year's slide. Uh, and I thought, I thought that was was rather interesting. Um, we'll see how the, the rest of the year plays out, but um, not a lot changed on this slide from last year. Well, yep, yeah, there we go. So obviously that begs the question, you know, cash rents, and this is getting you know a harder and harder question to answer. And, and again, I think it's important to put it in context with what we saw last year. Okay. Um, this, you know, this encompasses uh, the big three I states, um, you know, average cash rents. You know, this, of course, encompasses all soil types. So, you know, this, this can be, uh, you know, a little misleading if, you're only, if you only deal with class A acreage, but it, it, it's good to, to have a broad average for, for the, big, the big three there. We'll go ahead and move on to the next one. Again, you can kind of see uh, the direction that we're, we have been heading. Um, certainly, you can go back and, and look and see that that 2012 to 2014, um, the, the, the last, you know, bull, <laughs> the, the, the bull of the woods there, you know, and then we started to see some, some slow, slow softening, excuse me, 
some slow softening and just kind of treading water. But here, all of a sudden, you look at 2021 to 2022, that's a big jump. And that puts us right back to where we were, you know, on that last, uh, the last boom of, of 2012 to 2014. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this is, uh, you know, expected projections for 2023. So you, you look at 386 down to 248. And if, if you put that in comparison with, you know, the, the slide we just talked about, um, were continued to go up. I think, you know, on average, the expectation was for, for cash rents to, to go up around 5% uh, on a whole uh, in 2023. But again, you put that on top of the, the 20% average we saw in 2021, and, and you're looking at a 25% jump uh, in expected cash rents over the last year and a half. So uh, another interesting data point. And obviously, it goes without saying, eek, each neighborhood, each region, each farm, each community is uh, so unique and so different. And so it, it really is hard to try to broadly speak on, on cash rents. I mean, I, I have some, some even counties that I work in that even within one county, you can see some pretty big differences. So, so take that with a grain of salt, um, location, location, location. You've heard it a thousand times, but it's probably never been, never been more true. Um, the survey expectations for, for what we'll have to work with for the 2023 crop prices is, is what you see here. Obviously, right now, we're, we're trending a little bit higher than that, but the world moves at a pretty quick pace. We specialize in uncertainty these days, it seems. Uh, and so this is obviously subject to change, but this, you know, on the survey that was completed by July 1st, this is kind of where folks thought we might be averaging out uh, next year. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, this was an interesting one, and I'm excited to ask this question every year because I'd love to track its progress. So, you know, more and more, especially here in in my office, we you know get at least one solicitation every every week from different uh, type of energy projects. So, so 40% of farm managers have an arrangement in place with a wind company. And if we want to go on, I believe we have a, yep, a 38% have an arrangement with a solar company. Uh, slightly different, but again, kind of trendy questions is, especially after the, the issue with Russia and Ukraine is, is, is wheat. You know, are we going to see, um, are we going to see an increase in wheat acres? I personally have seen an increase in wheat acres. It hasn't been substantial, but as you can see, 33% expect an increase and again, most of those expectations came from, from Southern Illinois, which probably has a more recent and broad history uh, with, with the crop. Uh, and then finally, um, another, another tr trendy question, another question we get often here with farm managers is people interested in at least uh, learning more about organic farming or regenerative agriculture. I thought all four of these questions that are highlighted on this slide um, was, was fascinating. Um, moving on to leasing arrangements, to me it's interesting to note, and I know Gary did a did a s interview about this very thing. Is we've seen variable cash rents become the most popular projected lease, um, and this has been a slow move, but it's been consistent. And so yeah, now now we're we're seeing it. The variable cash rents are becoming popular, and for good reason. Volatility is the name of the game. A variable cash rent tries its best if done properly, to truly take into consideration what happens in a growing year. It's intended to be uh, firm but fair, as I like to describe it. So that was an interesting, um, that was an, an interesting note. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of blow through this here. There's a bunch of different ways you can do a variable lease. My, uh, you know, usually there obviously is a base. Um, you have a revenue level. You, you can use prices a variety of ways. There is interviews and, and articles uh, and videos to be had entirely based on this situation, um, but it's, it's not surprising that they're growing in popularity. We'll go ahead and move on. So yeah, so just kind of some, some blanket statements here. On average, if you take everything into consideration, the, you know, the entire average rose by 18% uh, across the state of Illinois. Um, cash rents continued to go up. Not as much as we saw last year, but still on average by another $17. That came up to uh, 
you know, around a 5% increase on, on what we saw in last year's, uh, at the end of last year. Um, and then again, we kind of touched on that, but that is, is, is what the participants saw as the average price for grain. Uh, time will tell. <laughs> time will definitely tell on that. And we'll have to see, uh, we'll have to see next year how, how close or how off we were. You, of course, have been uh, listening to and watching a farm doc webinar. Thanks to Luke Worrell of Worrell uh, Land Services out of Jacksonville. Uh, he has been the latest presenter. Also along with us is Bruce Sherrick uh, from the Center for Farmland Research here on campus. And Gary Schnitke is with us. I think there may be a couple of questions that uh, you all will want to answer. And Gary, I do have one from you or for you based on, I think, slide 55 or thereabouts, which shows the historical price of uh, cash rents uh, in the state. I'll come back to that and remind folks that we have a couple upcoming webinars. Farm Policy is next week, same time, 11 a.m. on Thursday. And then the following week, we'll talk about uh, expectations for acreage and what Brazilian agriculture will look like. Joanna Colosi will do that, of course. Uh, this has been uh, a, a primary production of FBFM, uh, Illinois College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences Extension, and of course, Agricultural and Consumer Economics, the department to which uh, both Bruce and Gary are uh, members. Thank you uh, for being with us, Gary. Uh, that that question uh, I, is, it, it shows that the managed farmland came down in price. I don't recall that that's actually the case in just the cash rents in general across the state. Is, that correct? There was there was one category where it did come down a little bit from what for, in good quality from 2020 to 2021, uh, or there was a couple, and that's just the way things work. <laughs> so yep, that's what the data yeah. said, and we reported as such. Um, yeah, I, yeah. My my I question was, was because I. For a long time, it had been only the '80s that had a had had a pushback in in the price and cash rents. Oh no, we had we had a cash rent pushback. Um, 12, 13. 12, 13 coming off highs. You'll see that in the averages as well. Not not as much obviously as in the 1980s, but 2012, 2013, we hit highs and then we came we we moved back down. Uh, a bit as we moved from the 2014 to 2019 to a, a sort of a less less uh, less vibrant time in agriculture, and now we got returns again. So we're moving those rents higher. Thank you for being with us today. I'm University of Illinois Extension farm broadcaster Todd Gleason.